So, good morning everyone. Time to get started. As usual, with some reminders. Um, maybe one reminder is to start the recording. Recording in progress. Another one not to drop the pen. <clears throat> So, uh, we would like to understand geodesics in the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, what's the point? Well, uh, for instance, we think that the Schwarzschild metric might well describe uh, our solar system. So, M here would be the mass of the Sun and uh, the motion of planets would be geodesics in this metric. So, let's see if this works. Uh, our first claim was that the motion is planar. And for this, uh, we look at the uh, uh, Euler-Lagrange equation for uh, the angle theta, theta. So the equation, the Euler Lagrange is of course d over ds, dl over d theta dot is dl over d theta. So d over ds dl over d theta dot, well, here I have the Lagrangian and I have to uh, differentiate with respect to theta dot, which appears here. So uh, there's a one half uh, which goes away with this two here, so there's one I don't worry about. Uh, so I get r2 and uh, theta dot. Right, so two theta dot from here, that one half goes away, and uh, from this dl over d theta, from sine square we get two sine cos, and goes away with this two, so sine theta, cos theta, and phi dot square. Okay, so this is the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation. And now uh, we do the following. Um, uh, choose coordinates uh, so that uh, the initial velocity and uh, the uh, well position and the initial velocity uh, lie in the plane theta equal pi half. Okay, so uh, you can always do this. Well, in fact, uh, if there, um, if uh, both, uh, if they're not collinear, then there is a unique plane sp spanned by these two vectors, and you just use coordinates so that uh, this is the plane. If they're not if they are collinear, then there's many planes uh, in which they lie. So you can choose any of them and you always can get this right. Uh, then, uh, so we call this one, uh, theta of s equal pi half for all time is a solution of one. And, uh, and has the right initial value, right? And uh, the initial values so which would be theta of 0 is pi half and theta dot of 0 is 0, right? Because you've chosen the plane so that theta dot initially 
uh, is zero. I mean, the velocity vector lies in this plane. So uh, theta dot initially is zero. So by uniqueness, this is the solution, right? So we don't need to solve this equation. This equation is terrible, of course, if you wanted to solve this. But uh, by uniqueness, uh, this is the solution, right? Is the solution. Good. So we have our solution. Um, by the way, uh, so this shows that it's planar. In fact, uh, if you think about it for three seconds, uh, if x, if the initial position and the initial velocity are collinear, uh, then the solution must be a straight line. And the way to see this is the follows. Uh, well, if uh, the initial position and velocity are collinear, uh, well, there are at least two planes. Well, there's many planes in which this thing's line, right? So there is this plane here, but there is this plane here as well. So uh, by this argument of uniqueness, the solution must lie in this plane, but it also must lie in this plane, but it also must lie in this plane, right? So it must line, the solution must lie in all, all planes, for which this line is, uh, has the initial values. In other words, but the intersection of two planes is, uh, is a straight line, so the solution must be a straight line. Uh, we don't really need this. I'm not writing this down, but uh, because we only need that it's planar, right? But it also works. It works whether these are collinear or not. If they're not collinear, then you have the position, you have the velocity, they form a plane. A unique one, and that's the plane with the line. If they're collinear, there are many planes in which they like, but this argument is still correct. Good. So from now on, uh, theta is going to be pi half all the time. Okay, so now we only look at, uh, uh, we can from now on assume that theta is pi half and only. Uh, analyze this. In particular, we don't need to look at this equation anymore. Uh, we only need, but we still need to look at the other ones. Uh, good. So let's see. Now, Schwarzschild has the property that geodesics are particularly simple. If you look more at more complicated metrics, like the Kerr metric, uh, the Kerr metric is supposed to represent a black hole which rotates. The Schwarzschild black hole is a non-rotating one. So if we take uh, the Kerr metric, you'd have to work much more to understand them. But uh, in Schwarzschild, uh, the Solutions are particularly simple because you have a lot of constants of motion. And so what we want to do is just to write down all these constants of motion and exploit them. And of course, the fact that the orbits are planar helps because it's not true anymore for, for curve. So things become more complicated. So in fact, this theta equation that I just erased is probably the, the most unpleasant one. And uh, well, we just got rid of it, right? So we don't have to worry about it.
Can you still hear me well? Because the system was making some strange noises. No idea why. I'm not... Now it's back to normal. Okay. I'm not uh, hidden by anything as far as I know, I hope. Good. So uh, this was the theta equation. Uh, let's look at, uh, uh, at the t equation, right? So remember the equations we want to understand are ds dl over dx dot mu is equal dl over dx mu. And now we're going to take, uh, well, first theta is by half now. And uh, we take x mu is equal t, then, uh, well, the one half has been chosen so that it always cancels out. Uh, so uh, if I differentiate with respect to t dot, I'm going to get minus v t dot, and which I, if I differentiate with respect to t, I get nothing because nothing depends upon t here. v is, depends only upon r, so I get uh, 0, which means that uh, v t dot is an equation of, uh, is a constant, uh, uh, a constant of motion, right? Constant of motion. So this was going to be our equation two. Uh, if I now take uh, uh, x mu is phi, uh, then again, the metric does not depend upon phi. Uh, there's no phi here. There was a theta, there's r, but there's no phi. So the, the right-hand side would be zero. And then this is uh, uh, dl over d phi dot. Uh, I get a 2, which cancels this 1 half. And r square sine square theta, well, let me just write it in, but it's, it's 1, right? And uh, phi dot. And this is 0, uh, which means that phi dot is a... Uh, r square phi dot is a constant j, again a constant of motion, right? What else do I have? Well, I could write down the equation x mu equal r, but forget it. Uh, you can do it, but it's a mess and we will not, not see anything interesting. What is interesting is to notice that uh, uh, the Lagrangian is conserved. And this is due to the fact that the Hamiltonian is conserved. Uh, right, so if we have a Lagrangian, we can write down a Hamiltonian. And uh, the Hamiltonian is conserved because uh, uh, the Lagrangian does not explicitly depend uh, upon S. So... Uh, and, uh, okay, so, and dh over ds is zero, and uh, so the, uh, uh, the Lagrangian two, and so this follows from the fact, right, that the Hamiltonian is, uh, let's see, how does this work? The Hamiltonian is dl over d, 
uh, x dot mu x dot mu minus L uh, good but so the Lagrangian is a quadratic function of uh, of the momenta so the derivative of this is uh, well, twice the Lagrangian, right? So this is twice the Lagrangian. I'm not going to do the calculation, right? But if you calculate dl over d phi, d, dt dot, right, then we get uh, this is quadratic, so we get a 2 because it's uh, 2 t dot. And if you multiply by t dot, you get 2 t dot squared. So again, the term you had, but it's a factor of 2. Right, so this is, uh, and the same for all our var all other variables. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, so the Ham Hamiltonian does not depend upon time the time, but the Hamiltonian is the Lagrangian. Uh, so the Lagrangian does not depend upon time. Right, so this is our equation four. Uh, so we have a new, another constant of motion, uh, a third one, which is coming from the Lagrangian, which I'm going to write like that, V dt over ds square plus 1 over V dr over ds square uh, plus r square d theta over ds Square, and I'm going to call this uh, lambda. And uh, we can also rescale S. Uh, so uh, just make a transformation S goes to AS uh, and choose A so that uh, uh, we have three possibilities where either lambda is equal to 1. And this is a time-like geodesic because uh, I've changed the sign here, right? I mean, so this is just uh, the Lagrangian is uh, just uh, one half of the length of the tangent square, right? So, but I've changed the sign here because there was a minus here and I've put a plus. So lambda 1 means that this length is negative, so it's a time-like uh, geodesic. Uh, so or 0, which is null. And of course, null is a little special because uh, this rescaling will not help you. Right? So if you rescale s, you're going to pick up a 1 over a square factor here. So, so lambda will scale. But if it was 0, it was 0, so it's not. You can always do this, but there is no preferred parameter. If uh, lambda was positive, then th there's a unique choice, well, up to sign, which will work. So there's a preferred parameter. Uh, and so the last possibility is uh, lambda equal minus 1, which is a space-like geodesic. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. Good point. And so this is going to be our equation five. Uh, good. So I need to, let's see what happened if I do this. No, it's probably not possible. It will not work. Uh, let's see. So I have to keep this one uh, and this one. So let me just first erase here.
So, so let's see, theta equal by half we just have, but uh, let's write 2, which was uh, dt over ds is equal e over v. 3 was d phi over ds is j over r square. And 5 is uh, well, let me uh, over immediately rewrite it uh, using these uh, 2 and 3. So it's going to be 6. So V is whatever it is. Uh, v dt over ds square, so it's e square over v square, minus 1 over v dr over ds square. Uh, nonsense. This was uh, phi, of course, right? Uh, theta is constant, and sine theta is. Uh, Not not good today. All right. D phi over D S. Okay. So uh, minus R square, and then D phi over D S square is going to be uh, J square over R four is equal lambda. Uh, let's see, so we can just simplify this a little bit. Uh, we're interested, well, here 1v cancels out. I'm going to do it maybe a little, let me do it slowly. 1 over v e square minus dr over ds square. minus j square over r4, r2, minus lambda equals 0. And I can calculate dr over ds out of this. Uh, so I have to multiply by v, and uh, that's it, right? So and, and put this to the right-hand side. So dr over ds square. Uh, is going to be e square minus v lambda plus j square over r square. Okay. So let, let's uh, check this. Slowly, right? So this one we have the signs right, v, 1 over v, r square, d phi over ds square. That's coming from the Lagrangian. And the length is uh, plus minus 1 or 0, right? So that's we're going to uh, assume this. So v, dt over ds, uh, that's a constant of motion, vt dot. So uh, e square over v square, 1v goes away. The minus is here, dr over ds square is here, r square is a minus, and d phi over ds, but d phi over ds is j over r square, so j square over r4, and everything is equal to lambda. So 1 over v times this, put it to the right hand side, I get that, and then Multiply by v, so this term drops out, but this one I have to multiply it by v. That's the same as was before. From here I get an e square, and this goes to the other side. Okay. So this is our equation 7. And uh, 
Good. So, uh, so we have a, 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 everything we want, right? Because this equation, now uh, we can integrate it by taking a square root, whatever. Uh, in fact, uh, you can integrate this explicitly, get elliptic functions, but who knows what elliptic functions are? I, I don't, or not that well. But there are explicit formula in terms of elliptic functions for this, so you can plot them or take tables or, or run any uh, software you, you, you like to plot the solutions. So you solve for, for R. Well, once you've solved for R, uh, you put in here, you can solve for t, and you put in here, you solve for phi, and uh, theta is pi half anyway, so, so we have our solutions. Right? So the point is to understand these solutions. So now our aim now is to understand these things, in particular understand what e is, what j is, uh, well lambda is plus minus one zero, so that's not that difficult. And, uh, and in particular, we'd like to compare this with what we know from Newtonian theory. So, uh, so our first aim, uh, um, first step to understand this is uh, to understand uh, u is, uh, which was m over r, because that was the thing that we understand very well for Newton's equations, right? So u is m over r. So that's the next thing. We're going to write down an equation for u. But at this stage, we're done, right? So we could just run any ODE solving procedure and have our solutions. So uh, suppose that you decide, after all, that you want to take this exam. And suppose you want to, uh, and I ask you, well, you know, my exams are a lottery, are, are a lottery right? So, so you, uh, there is this set list of questions, and then I'm going to randomly ask you one uh, out of this. So suppose that the question is motion in Schwarzschild, then you have to do this. And then you think, I forgot what U is, right? So is U uh, has to do something with R, so it may be something like 1 over R. Well, there is a 1 over R in the metric, right? So, so maybe 2M over R, and that is the thing not to do, right? So this is a, an embarrassing episode in my life when I set up, I set an exam where I, students were supposed to do this and was a writing, an exam in writing, and I, uh, I just wrote 2 because it's always 2M over R here, right? And then if you write two, you're going, you are not going to get the right equations. I mean, you're going to get equations, but they're completely different from the, well, they'll be different from the ones I'm going to derive, and therefore they'll be uh, not necessarily correct if you write down the correct ones without the two. So think about uh, if you don't put a two here, all right? Don't put a two, just stay with the one. So we have a new markers today, which are, uh, seem to be quite cool because they don't screech, right? You're probably not hearing the noise that you used to hear, but they don't want to go away. So you can't win uh, either a noise or it's going to be a pain to, to erase things. So.
Noises again. Can you hear some noises? No? It's only me? No, no, um, you're about to. But I think this is with the downward and the upward. If your traffic gets turned off and on, so it strikes me. Makes me nervous. <laughs> Uh, well, as long as you can hear me and see me, then I shouldn't worry too much. Maybe I should. Uh huh. So I should just be careful not to touch it. Uh, how can I not touch it? Good. So, so let's look at the equations for m over r, and of course. Uh, uh, as a function of phi, right? Uh, so assume um, j is not zero because that's, uh, that was the trick to do uh, in Newtonian, in the Newtonian case. Uh, let's see, so we just take du over ds, d phi over ds. d phi over ds is here, right? So this is 3. So d phi over ds, but it's inverse, so r square okay. d over d phi is r square over uh, J D D over D S, right? Once again, right? D over D, D phi is D over D S, D phi over D S. Uh, you can think of this as the ds cancelling out. I think that was probably the original derivation by one of our great uh, fathers in mathematics of how of this kind of equations. Now we know better, but uh, anyway, so that's one way of thinking about it. You cancel the ds's and that's what you get. Uh, d phi over ds is j over r square, okay, and now d over ds is m over r, so that's going to be r square over j and minus uh, m over r square dr over ds. Uh, okay, just uh, the chain rule. And of course, at the same trick as, as in the Newtonian case, so we get an equation minus m over j dr over ds. So now we put this into 7. So uh, d over d phi square uh, m square over j square and whatever we had here E square minus V lambda plus J square over R square. Right, D over D phi square, M square J square, E square minus V lambda plus, okay. Uh, so we get a constant which we don't care about. Uh, here we get uh, minus v and then lambda m square over j square. Uh, and now here the, the minus stays, uh, j square cancels out plus uh, m square over r square. So this is our u square. And of course, if you were silly enough to put a 2 here, then it just wouldn't work, right? So I mean, it would work, but you get all constants different. 
I did something wrong somewhere, did, did I? No, maybe not. So let me write it in full, right? Then m square e square over j square minus v is 1 minus 2u. Right, because u is m over r, so this is from v. And here we get lambda m square over j squared plus u square. Well, it doesn't look too bad, right? It's a little a bit nicer than before. Uh, was a kind of, there was 1 over r, r, four, uh, r square here, 1 over r in this equation. Now it's become polynomial, right? So at the right hand side, you have a polynomial here. And uh, so, uh, so this is, let's say, equation 8, or, yeah, equation 8. This is an equation we'll need later. Uh, not today, probably, but uh, at some stage. So uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, just in case, let's check if I have it right. Well, it looks pretty much like the equation I have in the book, so unless there is a misprint in the book too. But I think this one is okay. Good. So that's a, you, that, I mean, that's a, an equation you can, again, integrate uh, if you wanted to. But uh, what I would like to do is actually to get the second order equation of motion out of it. Uh, and one way of doing this is just to differentiate right? order equation. So uh, differentiate uh, d over d phi times 8. And so I'm going to get at the, so, so now this is confusing. This is the left-hand side or this is the right-hand side of the equation? For me, it's the left-hand side of the equation. So if I was sitting, standing in front of the blackboard, that would be, The right hand side for you, probably, right? That uh, which one? This one. Right now, it's the left hand side. Is it? it is, or the right hand side? Two, right? Well, never the. Okay, anyway, differentiate this equation and throw some. We we'll get 2 du over d phi times d2u over d phi square is d over du, uh, d over d phi. Well, uh, so I, I need to differentiate this with respect to uh, phi. So I can, f this depends through f upon phi through u. So I just do d over du of the right hand si side of uh, RHS times du over d phi. Uh, so the du over d phi cancels out, and I get d2 u over d phi square is one half of d over du of this expression here, right? So one minus two u. I'm done square, j square plus u square. Okay. So to finish this, I need to make some room here.
Yes? You forget the minus on the last equation on the right hand side. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let's see. So we should be able to do this de derivative, should we? Uh, so this is so the highest order terms would be minus two u cube. The quadratic terms. Plus u square, linear terms minus two lambda m square over j square u. And there's a constant which will drop out, right? So we don't care what it is. So uh, minus 2 becomes a plus 3u square u square uh, becomes 2u so minus u and this is a linear so minus minus is plus the 2 cancels out so we get plus lambda m square j square. Okay. So this is uh, d to u over d phi square. And this is going to be our equation 9. And uh, now this is really simple, right? This is really simple. Uh, if you didn't have this, uh, the, this term, this would be a harmonic oscillator or the same equation that we got in Newton theory, right? So solutions are linear combination of sine and cosine. And, uh, but so this is the new term. <coughs> Tulligan, apologies. Right, so this is the term coming from general relativity. If you compare this one, it's just essentially Newtonian. Uh, and uh, the equation we had was minus u plus u naught where u naught was so Newton and uh, I certainly don't remember let me just try to figure out what this was I think it was probably something like g that was g there must have been an m square probably m zero square over j Newton square Let me check if I remember it right, but I think that's, that's the correct equation. So we have a, so now for a, uh, the sign, if lambda is zero, then this term goes away. 
And there is no Newtonian equivalent, right? There is no Newtonian version of the equation of motion of light. Now we have. Uh, when lambda is minus 1, that's a space-like geodesic. There's no equivalent of space-like geodesics in Newtonian theory, so it doesn't matter. But when lambda is 1, then we get, uh, uh, well, and g is 1 because that's our uh, convention for when writing this metric here. Then uh, uh, m naught is the mass of the orbiting object, right? So here is 1. m is the mass of the central object. And j, obviously, here is the angular momentum, the relativistic one. Uh, this equation is just the fact that j is constant is the conservation law of angular momentum, obviously in direct correspondence with jn, if you want to directly think of these formulas in this spirit. So, so we have everything we wanted to know about, about uh, the equations. Now we want to understand the solutions. So that's uh, the next thing that we're going to do. And uh, let's start with something which is uh, kind of cool, which is the gravitational redshift. So the point is that the gravitational field changes the frequency of light. Uh, there are various ways of seeing that it must be the case if you think about the equivalence principle or things like that. But here we don't care about some kind of heuristic principles, uh, but we just uh, take it for granted that light moves, that photons move on geodesics, on null geodesics, and uh, we see what we get out of this for the Schwarzschild metric, right? So we don't need heuristics for that. So why I'm erasing, Eva, can you figure out what's the number of the next uh, section? Should be uh, 4.11. 5.11? 5.12. 5.12? 4.11. 4.11. Okay. So 4.11, gravitational redshift. Okay. So, of course, uh, whether it's a gravitational redshift or blue shift is a question of perspective. So, viewed in one direction, it's a redshift, in another, it's a blue shift. And I always have uh, difficulties remembering which way it goes. But I think that the idea is that if you're looking at light emitted at the surface of a star, then it's going to come to us redshifted. Okay. So we are, sitting, we are sitting away, and um, a star is sending light to us, then it's going to be, get redshifted. Of course, we, if uh, we are sit, sitting on the surface of the sun, which I don't advise you because it's kind of hot out there, uh, and somebody is sending light to you from the Earth, it's going to come blue-shifted, if you can see it at all. <laughs> uh, good. So... Uh, change of frequency in a gravitational field. And so uh, our aim, right, so de derive the formula. And the formula is something like that. Uh, omega 
1 over omega 2 is square root of 1 minus 2m over r divided by 1 minus m over r. So I think that this is the right formula. And so now one needs to decide. Uh, well, obviously written like that, it's 1. So it's not very useful. It can't be correct. So the question is whether here is 1 or here is 2. So let's uh, leave it like that and let's derive it. So in other words, you're looking at the frequency uh, you have an emitter at R1. We have an observer, so with frequency omega 1. Observer at R2, frequency omega 2. And we want to, to do this, right? So both are static, right? So they have, uh, so they're not moving, right? So if, they're, if they were moving, that would be an extra Doppler shift and all kind of nonsense like that. Uh, so, so they're static. In other words, uh, the forward velocity, right, is so, so we have S goes to uh, uh, or, or some parameter, yeah, well, T. So the world line are So the word lines are I can parameterize them by T, so we get T uh, R is equal uh, R1 or R2 and angles are theta uh, are the same, okay, so just for simplicity theta equals uh, same, same angle for both. Uh, let's see. Probably not need this equation 9 today, so let me just erase this. Well, the reason I don't need this uh, equation is because uh, I don't need to solve it uh, when I look at radial null geodesics. So remember my argument that if you start radially, you are radial. Uh, so, but, but then it's so. So you have no. Uh, you have no. You have no angular momentum. And uh, this is light, so it's propagating along null geodesics uh, and a null Geodesics, when you start out radially, is radial. So it's enough to use the conservation of uh, uh, of, uh, of lengths to solve the equation. So j is equal to 0 uh, here. And uh, lambda is 0. 
so we have the conservation equation minus v uh, dt over ds was uh, e over r. Uh, yes, so conservation uh, e over uh, over v, right? E over v. I, I'm just calculating the equation again because I just don't want to to worry about remembering it. Uh, so minus v e over v uh, plus one over v dr over ds square, and uh, the ang theta is constant and the angular momentum is zero. So this is zero. So it's easy to uh, to get the equation. Uh, yes. Yeah, so one v cancels out. So we get the dr over ds is uh, there's a plus minus from taking the square root. Uh, e square over v. Right? So e square is here. And uh, here I have v over v square. It's 1 over v. So is this over v or is it time v? Uh, let, let me do it carefully because uh, I, I'm completely confused now. So minus v e square over v dr over ds is uh, So minus v dt over ds, so it's e square over v square, plus 1 over v dr over ds squared is equal Zero. Oh, OK. <laughs> Fine. OK. So we just get, uh, yeah, so dr over ds is plus minus v, right? dr over ds is plus minus v. OK. So this one was easy. And uh, we get. Uh, it's easier if you do it right, but yes, thank you. <laughs> I was so happy that I get something simple that I just write it wrong. So E, right? So, so R is equal ES. So that, that one was easy. Uh, plus minus. And I'm going to take as not equal 0, of course. Uh, um, and so, uh, and look at dt over ds, right? So dt over ds is uh, uh, e over v, right? e over v. Good, but so I can write it dt over dr, right? dt over dr. I should have started with this one. This E cancels out. It's plus minus 1 over V. It's a very long way to, <laughs> to derive this equation. <laughs> Apologize. Let's start again. I mean, this is everything is correct here, but it's just way more complicated than needed, right? So to get this equation, you get it immediately from the fact that the length of the tangent is 0. So let me do it again. Uh, let's remember that the equation we want to derive is 10. And uh, uh, you just write, the, if you want to have dr over dt or dt over dr, you just get it immediately from the fact that the length is 0. And that's what I should have done to start with. So uh, as I said, I didn't do anything wrong here, but it's just much more complicated than needed. So.
Of course, why do, why do simple if you can do complicated, right? Makes it uh, look much more interesting and difficult and deep. Of course, it, it is deep, but it's very simple. Okay, so, so let's see. So L is zero, so lambda equals zero. So uh, the length of uh, the tangent is zero. Uh, and it's radial, so, uh, so we have minus V uh, dt over ds squared plus one over V dr over ds squared equals zero which is the same as dr over ds uh, square is equal minus v square dt over ds square, which is the same. Now, if I want to calculate dt over dr, So it's dt over ds divided by dr over ds. So uh, I need to take the square root of this. dr over ds will cancel out, and I get plus minus 1 over v. OK, good. So that's, <laughs> that's a terrible, <laughs> a quite a simpler way to derive the same equation. So apologies for this. Uh, so we just can solve it, right? So you would just get uh, t2 uh, minus t1 is the integral of from r1 over r2 uh, plus minus 1 over v of r dr. Now I could calculate this integral, but I don't care what it is. Actually, we'll need it maybe if we talk about the Shapiro effect. So let me just uh, use this. But now the point is the following, is that you have, so let's suppose we're outgoing, right? So we're going, we're going to, so you have R1 here, R2 here, and the time goes like that. And these are the world line of the uh, emitter. And this is the world line of the observer sitting here, and we have a solution of this equation, so we're emitting light from here, and it looks like that at time t1 at some time, and then we do it again later because we're sending a wave. So we have a delta t1 here and delta t2 here. So if we're sending a wave, there'll be a periodic signal, and uh, there'll be a fixed time interval between emission of crests, and there'll be a time interval, whatever it is, uh, at the uh, at the observation point. So. Uh, Therefore, we'll have delta T2 minus delta T1 is the difference of these integrals, which is 0. Because these integrals only depend upon the position 
don't depend upon the emission time. So the coordinate time elapsed between the emission of or ob observation of successive crests or trough of the wave is the same whether you're sitting at R1 or R2. So this might sound a little confusing if you think about it first because think, well, how can there be a, any kind of frequency shift if the times uh, between uh, successive crests are the same no matter where you are in your space-time? And the answer is that watch out because this is a coordinate time and frequency is something that you measure with respect to um, proper time. So yes, uh, the coordinate times are the same, but the proper times, so the times on the clocks of the observers, will not be the same. And uh, for this, you have to remember what stationary observers do. Right? So these are stationary or static observers. Well, stationary in general, in case of Schwarzschild, they're actually static. There is a, a the time flows differently the rate of flow of time depends where you are right so for a static observer static observer at uh, at r uh, so the word line is t goes to t r theta five, right? So these are constant, uh, and the vector dt over ds, well, the, the the tangent vector, so this is x mu of s, dx mu. Ah, I need to do better than this. I can do better than this. So the tangent to this curve is is uh, dt over ds and 0, 0, 0. Uh, the length of the tangent is should be minus 1. and is minus v dt over ds square, right? So dt over ds is, if you're flowing to the future, is uh, uh, let's see how does this go. I have to divide, so it's uh, 1 over v. Now, and this is time independent, right? So uh, delta t is delta s if I integrate over square root of v. So now I can put this into my equation for, uh, and let me call this equation 13, and let me copy 13 here so that we remember what it is. Uh, delta T1 is equal delta T2. And so if I want to correct for proper time elapsed at these points, then I have, of course, to take into account this time dilation or contraction or whatever factor that enters here, right? 
take into account the fact that time flows at different rates at various points of the gravitational field. So uh, delta, delta T1 is uh, delta S1 over square root 1 minus 2m over R1 is equal delta S2. Uh, well, is equal delta T2 which is uh, delta S2 divided by square root 1 over 2m over R2. And uh, omega 1 is proportional to 1 over delta S1. Right? So if we just look at the frequency, the frequency will be proportional to the inverse of the time between crests. Uh, omega 2 is proportional to 1 over delta S2. So if I take omega 1 over omega 2, this is then, because they're inversely proportional, it's delta 2 S2 to S1, and then it's square root of uh, S2 over S1, 1 minus 2m over R2. divided by okay so this is the redshift formula so now I'm telling you it's a redshift formula, but is it a redshift formula? Is it a blue shift formula? So uh, the question is then if R1 is smaller than R2, right? So if you're emitting from a star to us, then which one is bigger? So I'm going to work on my light bulb here. And uh, now let me check if I have the formula right. <laughs> because if it's test, if if it's the wrong formula, then of course it's going to, to go the the um, It's the correct formula. Okay, so uh, maybe there are mistakes in the derivation, but it is the correct formula. So uh, 
which one is smaller, right? If R1 is smaller than R2, then which one is smaller, which one is louder? Uh, so I need your help for this. A volunteer, please, to explain to me. The um, omega 1 should be larger than omega 2 since the fracture on the other side is greater than 1 because dividing by and then taking the twins uh, maintains that the, the R1 was now 2 and 4 divided it and throwing the contained in here. Well, so it looks like the only person I, uh, uh, on whom I can count is Liam. So thank you, Liam. <laughs> And uh, so you have to explain it step by step. How does it work? Um, so, well, square root is what? It's monotonous or something like that, right? So we don't have to worry about the square root if we want to understand this ratio. And what next? How do you explain next? Um, well, providing that R1 is less than R2, then 2m over R1 is greater than 2m over R2. So slow, slow, slow. Okay, so uh, which one is louder? Uh, from from the yes, is larger than this one. Yeah. Okay. So with the minus. That turns around again. So we have that the so this term is, is larger than the denominator. So this term is smaller than this one. So this is louder than one. That's the point. Yeah. So omega 1 is louder than omega 2. So is this a red shift or a blue shift? That's a bit where the mathematicians in me always get confused where the intersection of us. OK, so maybe a, the physicist in you will wake up, or maybe a physicist in, a, in the audience will wake up. So, so the argument was that, omega, that this is louder than 1, so therefore this is louder, right? Now, omega 1 is the frequency emission, and omega 2 is the observation emission, right? So this is the surface of the star, and this is us. We're sitting far away. So the observation frequency is smaller than the emission frequency, so it's a redshift, right? Smaller frequency means redshift. Right, so high frequency light is blue. Low frequency light is red. So this is our redshift formula for good. Can someone tell me how much time I have left? To I think only like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, so 10 minutes should be good enough for something called the Shapiro effect. And uh, so Eva again, what's the number of the new section? It's 4... 4.12. 12, thank you. Well, you know what? I'm not going to start a new section. So let me just tell you uh, about the uh, experiments which go with this. Right? So uh, this thing has been experimentally verified. OK, so the, the first uh, uh, suggestions about this was, uh, well, Eddington actually tell, suggested uh, in the 20s, look at uh, uh, neutron stars. And... Uh, but so it, it's hard to say whether this is actually a, a verification or a prediction because you're looking at series B 
and you see a, a, you can interpret the spectrum of Sirius B as a gravitational uh, redshift of the spectral emission lines, right? So you know what the, for this kind of star, what kind of uh, spectrum you would expect, and you find that it is shifted, and it gives you uh, an interpretation of the shift of light coming from, uh, uh, from Sirius B. Uh, so so uh, Sirius B would be uh, one of them, but it's not really a verification, it's a prediction, right? But so uh, the famous experiment is uh, Pound and Repka. Uh, and if you want to look up the year, you just, uh, maybe somebody can look up the year on Wikipedia while I'm talking, a source of knowledge. Uh, so just one quick uh, comment. So uh, if Sirius B is a white dwarf, right? Yeah, whatever, uh, stars, uh, okay, uh, okay. Stars. A uh, white dwarf, is this a neutron star? I, I thought it was. No, uh, it's not? Okay. So thank you. But okay. So, so, okay, good. So, uh, I know of measurements of Sirius B. Okay? So, thanks for correcting this. So, this would be a white dwarf. Okay. Not a neutron star, but still a dense object and dense enough so that you can get a, uh, a measurable effect of it. So, Pound Repka, anyone has checked the. Uh, should, which we. 59. 59? It's that old? I thought it was 62 or something like that. Okay, anyway, so, so that's a tower, right? So, you just take a tower. Uh, it turns out that there was a tower at the campus of Harvard University, and you uh, send light. Uh, I always thought they're sending down, but I'm not sure whether they were sending it down or up, actually. But so, so take a source, maybe let's define the sending down just for the sake of the argument, right? So you put a source sending uh, of, of, of light here, of uh, gamma rays uh, at the top. And uh, I think there's something like 20 meters here or something of this order. And so, uh, and you, you, so you, you send from here, you observe here, and, uh, and they confirmed, I think, up to 10%, uh, right? So less than 10% accuracy. Well, at the accuracy of 10%, confirmation, right? Confirmation. Um, confirmation at 10%. Uh, And uh, while well, there is an interesting experimental story involved, how do you detect such a small uh, change of frequency? And so there's something called the Mosbauer effect uh, involved into this game, and uh, uh, that's what they exploited here. Uh, another experiment, it's an experiment which we discussed already in the special relativity lecture for those who were there, and it's the uh, Hefele Keating experiment. I think 72 or something like that, but maybe somebody can check in Wikipedia and co confirm the date. 72 for Hefele Keating. And maybe somebody remember, remembers from the special relativity lecture what was the Hefele Keating experiment about? So, um, the usual, uh, 71. 71. And what, do you remember what it was about, Eva? Say it again. Yes, and how uh, uh, special relativistic time dilation, and how did it go? What did they do? Exactly, right? So you put clocks on an airplane. So, so here is your favorite Earth, and you have an airplane flying either in this direction or uh, then a second one also in the other direction. And uh, well, there are two effects here. First, the 
plane is moving with about 1,000 kilometers per hour, so you have a special relativistic time dilation. But because the plane is not on the surface of the Earth, but, uh, well, whatever they flew at this time, but the standard height is, what, 10 kilometers or something like that? Now that's why they like to, to, to fly, right? So then you have, uh, then, uh, then there is a effect coming both from uh, special relativity uh, because of the velocity the gamma factor and two there is this gr uh, redshift right so gr redshift now you think about it for two minutes if the earth is rotating uh, the special relativistic effect will be stronger if you go this way because your velocity will be the velocity of the plane plus the velocity of the rotation. And if you remember your special relativity formula, there is some gamma factors involved, but at this velocity, the addition uh, formula works very well. So the velocity, the uh, time dilation effect in this uh, direction, when you fly in this direction, will be actually uh, stronger than if you fly if your plane flies in this direction because then the velocities will cancel but the gr effect will be the same right so so you could what you can do is just to calculate the effect one way calculate the other can take the difference and you'll get the gr redshift out of this right so this is uh, in any case uh, hefele heating Uh, 72. And now the uh, most accurate uh, result is uh, actually uh, so, uh, so, so delta t, delta omega over omega smaller than 10 to minus 5 or of the order. Okay, so the, what, okay, so what I want to, no, so, so the delta omega predicted minus delta omega measured divided by uh, omega is uh, smaller than 10 to uh, minus 4, something like that. This is the uh, ESA satellites, some uh, a few years ago. So what happened is that uh, two satellites were sent uh, uh, on a Soyuz rocket to take part in the, the European GPS system. And normally the GPS satellites are on a, an orbit where the radius is constant. However, something went wrong with the launch for two of these satellites, and they ended up on elliptic orbits. But then if they were on elliptic orbit, then the distance from the Earth was varying quite a bit. And that was uh, not good for the GPS system, but that was a blessing for science because you could just measure uh, this uh, uh, r as a function of t as, as you're moving along the orbit. And, uh, and uh, with this uh, failed launch of these two GPS satellites, or not quite successful launch, so the launch didn't go completely wrong. It still managed to put the satellites on orbit, but on wrong orbits, uh, you could good, make some science for, uh, without having to write application grants or anything like that, just given to you. Good, so, so this is the gravitational redshift. And uh, Thursday, we all take a deserved rest. So, if there are any questions or comments, I'll take them. And if there aren't, then I wish you a nice week and see you, see you in a week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.